So uh, good afternoon, and uh, I want to give a big thanks to everyone for attending today's session. We have received a, a really high number of people who've signed up, so we're really enthused by the interest that this panel seems to have generated. So my name is Adam Rust, and I'm a senior policy advisor at the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, and I'm going to moderate today's framework. Um, and I kind of want to paint in some broad brushes just an initial framework for the conversation. So when we talk about Web3, uh, in some ways we're talking about a second revolution. Um, and, it, and I say that because it could have a level of disruption that is, well, very significant. Uh, we talk about FinTech and that was the first level of disruption. And if you think about what FinTech brought, it really, uh, in some ways, it was the digitization of some things that had already been available. So with the ways that people spend, save, borrow, uh, we're, we're, we're reintroduced, uh, usually for the purpose of creating a simpler consumer experience and done by both uh, banks and non-banks. Um, well, when we think about Web3, it could be equally disruptive, but I think in different ways and to different effects. Uh, it will certainly impact the consumer experience, but its significance will also extend to the infrastructure and the rails on which banking itself is offered. So I'm going to hit three quick headlines, which is um, that I hope you can take from this. First, that the amount of control that consumers and small businesses have over their data uh, will be influenced by these technologies. It could constrain some of the data monetization models that we're all familiar with now, um, and that could be a good thing. Uh, secondly, when I say infrastructure, uh, two of the ones that I want to call out are blockchain distributed ledger technologies. We're going to mention a few others uh, briefly, but you know these are key aspects of what's happening. And then Third, that there are some things in financial services that are not working so well currently. Uh, and I, I can think of two that I'll mention, but that Web 3.0 could really possibly do them in better ways. So for example, the efforts that banks do to combat, combat money laundering, there are ways in which these technologies really provide new services. And then relatedly, uh, all the efforts that banks and non-banks do to know their customers you know, we know of real financial exclusion problems that develop when people don't have enough uh, documentation or their credit invisible. Some kinds, in some ways, Web3 can resolve some of those issues. So saying that, I'm going to ask my panelists to introduce themselves. And why don't I start with Joanne? Hi, thank you, Adam. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Joanne Barefoot. But I am CEO and co-founder of AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. We're a nonprofit based in the U.S., but global in scope, working on modernizing the banking, uh, the, the regulatory technology uh, in use in the system, and with a primary goal on financial inclusion and um, consumer protection and anti-money laundering. And I am a former deputy controller of the currency. So I bring a former regulator's lens to these topics. And Adam, may I say, I just wanna commend you for doing this event. Um, I think it's so impressive to be uh, having community and consumer advocacy organizations focusing on these cutting edge technologies that which are potentially going to bring good things and bad things. And this is the time to be thinking about them. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Joanne. And so with that, I also want to give a shout out to Brad Blauer, who's been a big part of this as well. Absolutely. Shamir, do you want to jump in? Happy to, Adam. Uh, my name is Shamir Karkal. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Scylla, which is an API platform for programming with money. Uh, we're an early stage startup ourselves. We've been around for uh, about four years um, and we serve a bunch of customers, both in the FinTech and in the crypto space. So we get to see, uh, uh, you know, we get to see the development of both really. Prior to this, um, I used to run the API platforms at BBVA, which is a large Spanish bank. Uh, and then about 13 years ago, I co-founded a fintech startup called Simple, uh, which was pretty much the first neobank uh, anywhere. Uh, and that's really where I got to know the, uh, the fintech space and kind of uh, uh, began to get familiar with it. Uh, prior to that, I used to be a consultant. Uh, and long time ago, I used to do a lot of software engineering. Great. Donna. Hi, yeah, um, I lost you all for a minute, uh, my technology 
failed me for a second there, but I'm back now. <laughs> so uh, I'm Donna Murphy. I'm a current Deputy Comptroller uh, for Compliance Risk Policy at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is the National Bank Regulator. And um, uh, for those of you who don't know, Compliance Risk Policy at the OCC means that my team and I are responsible for developing policy and guidance and disseminating uh, those in exam procedures and other supports for our bank examiners uh, in the areas of fair lending, consumer protection, Community Reinvestment Act, anti-money laundering, and uh, financial sanctions. So um, just happy to be here today and really appreciate Adam and Brad and others at NCRC for putting together this important uh, webinar. Thanks, Donna. And, and I think we're really rec lucky to have a regulator here because just as this is disruptive on the creation of financial services and the consumption of them, it's also the case that regulators are going to be facing a lot of new questions. So great to have you here, Donna. So quickly, we're going to do a little bullet round of vocabulary. Just maybe perhaps that can help some of the folks that aren't totally up to date on cryptocurrency and all the other things here. Um, I thought I'd start uh, with tokenization and permissioning. And I'm going to alternate between uh, Joanne and Shamir. Donna has, um, for obvious reasons, I can't entirely define things because of uh, where she's coming from as representation of her organization. Shamir, why don't you take the first one? Happy to do it, Joanne. I'm not saying I'm going to be right, but I'll give it the old college try. <laughs> so so which that's one tokenization and, and permissioning. Gotcha. So, uh, Tokenization is actually not that necessarily a new technology. There was, you know, uh, even, even pre-Bitcoin, there was talk of like um, issuing tokens for things such as like credit cards online, right? But really the idea behind uh, tokenization is that you can issue these individual um, uh, like tokens, right? Like a, a unique uh, identifier uh, which acts as a replacement for something else. Uh, broadly speaking, the idea is that you can take so many different types of information, uh, which can represent assets, which can represent money, which can represent different th uh, things. They can represent trust, for example, um, and sort of embody some of the qualities of that and, and capture it and represent it through uh, what's essentially a unique identifier in a description in a database would be a centralized, but we're typically talking about distributed databases like blockchains, and then uh, put permissions around it, right? Um, so one of the kind of the, the best ways that I find about like thinking about tokenization and permissioning is that it really refers to a set of technologies which allow you to program with um, things that were was really very hard to program with before. Um, things like money, um, things like digital assets, things like uh, payments, um, and, and things like trust. And you're like, well, how on earth do you program with those? And I'm like, well, first you have to start off by tokenizing it and then permissioning it. And then you can then create whatever you want to around it. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's, we're, we're having an expert here. So it's, <laughs> you get a good response. Um, how about blockchain and distributed ledger? I don't know if that's too much to explain in, in a short summary, but, well, it is, but maybe a quick highlight there from Joanne. Yeah, I'll give a quick highlight. I'm always intimidated around my friend Shamir, who, as we he mentioned, can write code, unlike me, and knows what he's talking about on technology. Um, but uh, I think most people know that uh, the, the brains behind Bitcoin was the pseudonymous person or people calling themselves Satoshi Nakamoto. And the breakthrough idea was the creation of a blockchain that would enable uh, creation of a record, an immutable, unchangeable, permanent record that would show a chain of transactions or a chain of records that become a source of trust so that people who don't know each other and otherwise wouldn't trust each other or would have needed a middle, middle person, lawyer, broker, something like that can have confidence that they can transact with each other safely uh, because everyone who has access to that blockchain can see what's going on 
going on at, yeah, on it at all times. So it's the backbone of Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency. Distributed ledgers, I'm again, Shamir, feel free to improve on this, but they're but basically a blockchain is a type of distributed ledger. Not every DLT distributed distributed ledger technology system has uses blockchain, but it's the same idea that you're distributing this transparent ledger that everyone can see. Super. So um how that about great, Joanne? Oh, oh thank you, Shamir. <laughs> Uh, Shamir, do you want to take NFT? Sure. Um, NFT stands for uh, non-fungible token. Um, and this really all came about uh, not so much with, with Bitcoin, but really with Ethereum. Um, so the uh, Ethereum is another blockchain, uh, public blockchain, which was launched, I think, 2016 or so. Uh, Bitcoin went live in like 2009. Um, and uh, Ethereum has a lot more capabilities. Um, and, and you can directly program on Ethereum in a way that was never possible and is not possible on uh, on Bitcoin, right? Um, and so where Bitcoin ha has and is fundamentally about like one particular token, uh, Bitcoin itself, <laughs> that is uh, that is the primary uh, asset that's traded back and forth and, and that the ledger keeps track of, the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain keeps track of. Ethereum, because of its flexibility, allows you to create all sorts of tokens, right? So now on Ethereum, you're not limited to just the inbuilt token of the network, which is Ethereum. You can go on Ethereum. There's a bunch of blog posts on Medium. You don't probably have to know a little bit about programming, but you do not have to be a good programmer. If you had a few hundred dollars worth of Ethereum, you could go and create your own token on the Ethereum network today afternoon. It's totally doable with not too much tech skill, right? Um, the, the, the issue then becomes like, what are you creating these tokens for? And you can create them for anything you want. One particular class of these tokens is what's called non-fungible tokens, which means that the tokens are unique. So if I have a, an NFT smart contract on Ethereum, a smart contract is just a piece of code that issues and manages these tokens, then um, you can say, hey, I have a token that represents something, let's call it X. You have another token issued by the same uh, contract, but the two are not the same. They are not fungible. They're not exchangeable for each other. Um, so one of the primary properties of like, money as an example, uh, but even of other classes of assets like stock as an example is that it's fungible. Uh, a dollar bill is basically the same thing as another dollar bill. There's no real difference between them. While uh, a, a one share of Apple stock is the same as all the other billions of shares of Apple stock. But when you're talking about things like art, you're talking about things like land, when you're talking about things like the majority of real assets out there in the world, they're all unique and different. One piece of land is different from every other piece of land one drawing of a, um, of, a, of a kitten or of an ape is completely different from every other digital or physical drawing, right? So NFTs are typically used to represent a, uh, some other real asset, whether it's uh, a you know digital art where it has really taken off um, or physical art or physical assets and represent that, hey, this uniquely represents this asset, another uh, token issued is represents another asset. So that's kind of like the fundamentals that you have to understand about, uh, about NFTs. The real potential, of course, is that, hey, once you tokenize them and you have them on the black blockchain, they are a lot more tradable um, 24, 7, 365 than it typically is with things like you know, real world assets. Thanks, Shamir. And, and we're having people introduce themselves in the chat, and that's great. It's good to see all these interesting people here. So thank you for doing that and continue. Um, I, I, in terms of NFTs, one thing that I think is worth raising is that a lot of creators are finding that they have the ability to put their art out there, uh, put what they've made, and then control it, control the, control the use of it, and then benefit from it financially. So it's raising up some people's uh, financial... Exactly health. There we go. Um, the last one I want to hit upon, and I'm going to ask Joanne to cover this one, is what's known as a, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. What can you do with a DAO? 
what can't you do with a DAO? <laughs> <laughs> so a decentralized autonomous organization is a new and alternative way of organizing a group that wants to work together on something without creating a corporate form or a, or a traditional formal entity. The people in it are in, their, in it voluntarily. They are cooperating with each other in a decentralized way and they self-govern uh, through their group without having a hierarchical uh, uh, system with someone in charge. And, uh, and, it, and they do it autonomously and they're, they're primarily uh, doing it through open source code. And from a regulatory standpoint, it raises a fascinating challenge because if we ask how would you regulate a DAO if there isn't a thing to regulate there, um, it's a very, very novel type of question, a head scratcher. And there, there are thoughts on how to go about doing that or how to force financial DAOs into um, some kind of a, a structure that is easier to regulate, or maybe the regulator uh, participates in the DAO as one of the players or even has veto powers or, uh, you know, it's it's a mind bender from a thinking in about financial regulation. Absolutely. So um, I thought quickly, there's this term Web3, and what does that mean? In and of itself, it almost begs for a definition. I'm going to give the panelists the chance to do Web2 and 3. I'm going to hit Web.01 quickly, which is just that if you go all the way back to when, um, well, if you are old as me, uh, there was a point in time when the internet was things like Netscape, and it was gray with some blue lines, and the person who owned the website was the only person who could put the content out there. So you could call it in a very simple sense, read only. Um, how about Donna? You haven't had a chance. Donna, tell us what 2.0 means. Well, Adam, uh, I first have to say that, um, that you know the OCC does not have a definition of Web 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> So okay. <laughs> I can tell you what my personal understanding of it is. And, and I mean, from a, from a financial perspective, I think of, and this is only from a financial perspective, of course, Web 2.0 is much, much broader than just financial. But from a financial perspective, I think of it as the fintech, uh, you know, the fintech boom that we've seen over the last several years, where you have a disaggregation of financial services um, that, you know, sort of maybe Traditionally, we're bundled, and um, many people, you know, obtained all or almost all their banking, their financial services from a bank, and now you have just a plethora of digital uh, fintech companies out there, and a lot of them offer very targeted, very specific services uh, to people in very new and novel ways. Sorry, I didn't realize that's also a definition. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a definition. On air. Oh. Joanne, how about 3.0? Tell us something. What, what, what does that mean? Why are we using that term? So before I take a stab at that, I, I think a good uh, thing to maybe lay as groundwork here is that it's not just the OCC that doesn't have a definition. These terms are incredibly fluid. These are young, young. It's Rub 3.0 is very, very young. And if you asked, you know, 10 supposed experts on it, you'd probably get 10 different answers. So we kind of know what I, we're I talking about. I think you about. could get 15 out of 10 experts. <laughs> exactly. So even the language is evolving. But basically, Web uh, 3.0 is building on the, as you, you said, Adam, uh, 1.0 was was thought of as a read, uh, where you can read something on the internet, and 2.0 has defined been defined as read and write. We can interact, we can put content onto the internet and take it off, and so on. Web three is thought of as read, write, and own. That there, the Web two was not designed very well to be a, a place for transmitting value um, as opposed to information and it's insecure it's got we'll be talking about a lot of the problems with web 2.0 and web 3.0 uh, 
there's a deployment of blockchain technology along with evolving artificial intelligence and other tools to create a more secure system that will make it easier for people to own their own data, uh, or at least this is the hope and promise of it, own and control your own information better and become decentralized and therefore, as you alluded to Adam at the beginning, not dependent on the big data aggregators, the, the big platforms like Facebook or Google, but able rather to interact with one another without these intermediaries, have more control over our data and, um, and maybe in, in the utopian thinking that goes along with some of this, maybe real empowerment for people to be able to interact differently in terms of their um, economic lives and, and building wealth and, and so on. So I think the 10 people in the room, 15 definitions, uh, this is really true. And yes, this is about financial services. It's about the internet in general. Financial services may be the vanguard, the first place that Web3 is really applied in a meaningful way. And kind of with that, I, I sort of want to shift the question. You know, if this was a newspaper article and it was the first three paragraphs, basically, why am I bothering to understand about this? Why am I going to read the rest of the story? You know, why does this matter? Why does it matter for consumers in financial services? Uh, Shamiri, I, you're, you're, it's your turn to, to offer something. Tell, tell me why I should care. Well, so if you if you just take a step back, right? Like um, the internet as a technology is what, 31, 32 years old. I think um, Tim Berners-Lee came up with uh, HTML and HTTP back in like 1990 or so. Um, so it's not that old. Uh, financial services as an industry is much older. I mean, thousands of years old, <laughs> in, in, somewhere in the dawn, in the, you know, in the mists of time. But uh, and financial services is also one of the largest industries on the planet. Um, global financial services revenue is around 20 trillion a year out of a global GDP of like 100-ish trillion. Um, so this is one of the biggest uh, industries out there. And of course, that makes sense. The real world is not made out of advertising. Uh, it's made out of like, you know, physical stuff, right? Like manufacturing, agriculture, financial services, transportation. Uh, these have all been around for centuries, thousands of years. They drive what the real economy is. When the internet came along in the 90s, the first thing that it really revolutionized was like advertising and, uh, and communications, really, both of which were very small and nascent industries at, back then and still are, even though the internet has completely transformed them, right? Uh, and then, of course, it began to affect more and more industries through the 90s. There was the Netflix moment where, you know, uh, all of that. Uh, but even now, if you look at everybody from like PayPal 23, 25 years ago to Scylla, and you combine all of it together, uh, all, the in, all the FinTech plus crypto innovation of the last 23, 25 years, we are less than 2% market share of that, you know, 20 trillion in in revenue globally, right? And I assure you, that's a lot more PayPal than it is. <laughs> uh, but uh, but 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 that's the reality of it: is that the, the this the, this industry is going to change because the world of I don't know the 2050s is going to look very different from the world of the 1950s. It already does, but not so much in financial services. If you looked in financial services, just at the top high-level data, you might blink and just miss the entire internet revolution. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's still the big banks, it's still the big brokers, it's still the big investment banks, and the financial crisis of 2008 had a way bigger impact on the industry than anything that the tech has done in the last 20 years. That's changing, though. Um, and the the kind of the, uh, the the impact of that change is now being felt at like the consumer level, right? Uh, consumers and businesses don't want banks and they don't want broker dealers they don't want investment banks right like they, they they fundamentally don't care about any of this they just want access to financial services and they want financial well-being um financial well-being and like physical you know health and wealth those are the two most important things in the lives of kind of like most people if you have those covered then you're probably on a good trajectory in life and i think now 
with we've seen how much technology like i wear you know i wear multiple devices that track my heart rate and and from a second to second and who knows what else but like that sort of like uh technology has been deployed in health to really improve the li lives of people and keep them healthier um and and we've seen all the wonderful things that have happened with vaccines and us that hasn't really happened in financial services yet not on a broad level not to impacting like 98% of people but it's going to happen and it's beginning to happen and it's happening if you slice that up into subsectors you'll see sectors which have completely changed in just the last 5 6 years and i think web 3.0 especially has the potential to not just change that and say hey we're not going to just replace the chase with paypal or you know it's, it's not just like new co corporations replacing the old corporations but a whole new paradigm of how we can potentially return power to the people and i think that's why web 3.0 matters interesting i want to ask the same question in kind of a same but different way which is for donna so how if i'm a regulator am i looking at this and thinking how does this matter for what i do um well that's a really good question adam but i'm i'm also going to um follow up a little bit on what shamira said cuz i think it is absolutely true that many people you know uh, want their financial services and, and it's not really about whether they want a bank or a fintech they want they want financial service but what they want at least from our my experience is trust and reliability in their financial services and that's uh, i think one of the reasons why um you haven't seen banks disappear you know five or ten years ago when fin there were many fintechs out there that said we're going to break we're going to replace the banks you aren't going to see banks in five years and what's happened instead I think is that banks have adapted and evolved and um in many cases are offering the same kind of services as fintechs disaggregated services in many cases have partnered with fintechs or in, in a whole range of ways that you know goes well beyond the, the this particular webinar but that that trust and reliability is I think why you see um the continued uh at least from the consumer perspective the continued use of banks and web 3.0 does have the tremendous potential to change how consumers and the financial services industries interact and and um you know as regulators what we're doing is we're you know as regulators are we're cautious but we're we're trying to be really proactive in terms of monitoring those developments you know determining how we can understand them how we can um implement them how we can continue to uh apply the laws and regulations and the supervision that hopefully support and provide that trust and reliability that consumers are looking for um and one of the things that i think you know this and this is you know from from a perspective of that trust and reliability the more that you go to that that really sort of um i think joan called it utopian view of consumers controlling all their own data you know interacting never giving that data then that puts a real premium on what i'm going to call privacy literacy and data literacy um on what we now sometimes call financial literacy consumers um you know if you have a financial intermediary like a bank or a fintech you can you know sort of trust them to take your data or your 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 um your finances and handle whatever transaction you want if the consumer is handling that all on a p to p as we call it by person to person or p to b person to business basis then it really puts a premium on making sure that we as regulators and as as government and as society are uh empowering consumers to have that information to do that in a way that that continues to protect themselves and get the outcomes that they want so yeah, all that exactly uh joanne one thing that i heard her kind of emphasize but i would really love you to go deeper on it is the question of privacy why is that so important in this conversation yeah so i mean when we ask why should we care the as i said before no one knows where this is going but there are a lot of people who believe that this shift from web 2.0 to 3.0 will be as big as the the arrival of the internet itself uh and similar things are going to happen in changing how we live 
And we need to care about it because if we could turn the clock back and go back to the beginning of Web 2.0 uh, and foreseen that one of the results of it would be a huge loss of privacy because our data was going to be, as they say in, in uh, the UK, hoovered up, uh, vacuumed up and um, put to use by big data companies. We might have tried to design it differently. That was not envisioned by the people at the start. They were picturing a whole different kind of thing, more like Web 3.0 is, you know, more um, uh, autonomy from different players. But as it evolved, the, the financial model behind it evolved to reward companies that could gather all our data and use it and sell it. And that's where we are today. And we have insecurities also in which other people can just flat steal it. So part of the logic here is to build in these privacy connections, again, relying heavily on blockchain technology that creates this immutability of the record uh, and tokenization, as Shamir said at the beginning, that allows us to interact with each other without having to reveal everything about ourselves. There are a bunch of other privacy technologies that are evolving along with this, new ways of thinking about the ability to um, uh, not have to reveal everything about yourself. There's a thing called zero knowledge proof, for example, in which you shouldn't really have to hand your entire ID card or driver's license over to a clerk at a liquor store when all they need is the answer yes or no, are you old enough to purchase alcohol? And there's, there's a lot of technology that's enabling us to let people have more control over their privacy, let them uh, share privacy in different ways in different places, potentially let us be paid for allowing our data to be used. There's a whole line of thinking in Web3 that it will lead to that model. I don't know if I'm totally convinced of that myself yet, but, um, and so anyway, a lot of ways of building more control, more privacy uh, into the system. Um, that's a big piece of it. And, and if I could just say the other big potential promise of it is just by driving down the technology costs, the transaction costs compared to what we have today, there's a big hope for much, much more financial inclusion and access because it'll simply be inexpensive to do a lot of things that cost money today, remittances, even just day-to-day -day financial transactions with more data, more technology power in there. There's more opportunity to serve more people at affordable levels in, in this potential future system. Exactly. So I think one of the things that she's raised up there is a little bit of a comparison to where things stand now, what's out there now. And she mentioned data monetization as an, an example. Uh, I guess I'd ask the panelists, to, you know, what is this fixing? Is there something that needs fixing that Web3 can address? Uh, maybe Donna, I, I mentioned a few of them at the beginning, but uh, Donna, could you highlight something that you see could be, you know, resolved by these new technologies? So um, I'm not going to say it's going to be resolved by the new technologies. Like like Joanne says, that, you know, there's a lot that could happen, and I don't. You know, I, I don't know the people who invented Web 2.0, but I don't think they envisioned it working out the way that it has. Um, but there are certainly there are certainly prospects for it um, uh, in terms of privacy. Um, you know, the, the privacy enhancing technologies that Joanne has mentioned, I think, are incredibly interesting and hold lots of promise for um, enabling people to transact um, in in ways that you know they can't now without sharing without sharing lots of data that's may, maybe not directly relevant to the transaction um you know from a financial crime perspective um which is one of the other things that i do um right now you know uh banks are have met you know extensive requirements for monitoring and reporting potential suspicious activity but we know that most criminal networks at least most most sophisticated ones don't use just one bank and because of the restrictions on, you know, the, the very legitimate restrictions on banks sharing privacy data, banks can't really, sh in most instances, share data about transactions in order to figure out 
what the network might be. But with these privacy enhancing technologies and with some of the uh, technology underlying distributed ledger technologies, there may be, there, there are, I think, you know, there are not just maybe, but there are opportunities that, that many financial institutions are exploring right now to be able to share the key information about potential criminal activity without exposing customer private, you know, private customer data um, to other entities. So there's there's just all kinds of promise about things that could be better under this uh, uh, under under this kind of system as we move forward. And I you know that's great. Um, uh, I mean, but there are also there are also risks. Um, one of them I mentioned earlier is I do think that this um, greater control and um, uh, potential for you know uh, individual consumers really having much more control over specific transactions puts a premium on ensuring that consumers have the information and the knowledge and understanding to be able to utilize that, to understand what tokenization is and how the distributed ledger technology works that they're using to transact um, in these areas. Um, also, another type of financial crime that we look at all the time is fraud. And um, you know, right now, banks and some, some fintechs have extensive, extensive systems for, monitor, for monitoring transactions to detect anomalous transactions and protect consumers as well as themselves from fraud. Um, and if you have a web 3.0 uh, environment where each individual consumer is conducting individual transactions um, with their financial data, then you know who's monitoring for fraud? Who who is there, you know, is there an entity out there that can sort of in real time detect potential fraudulent transactions. I mean, if you're like me, you've gotten emails or texts from your bank saying, hey, you know, some, somebody's trying to use your credit card in, you know, some other country where you are not right now. Should we stop this transaction? Um, you know, is that going to, is there going to, is something like that, some kind of protection like that going to be available in a web 3.0 environment? So um, challenges, opportunities, and risks, I think, uh, across the board in, in this area. Um, Shamir, Joanne, do you want to jump in and kind of add to that? Sure. Um, so the uh, kind of like one thing, just like a few observations, right? Like the, the sort of the whole thing about like Web 2.0 and especially Web 3.0 actually goes back to Web 1.0. Uh, when Tim Berners-Lee created HTTP and HTML, um, he understood that he wasn't creating an internet protocol for money and he wasn't creating an internet protocol for identity. He was just creating an internet protocol for like these newfangled things called web pages, right? Uh, but he, he kind of understood that people might want to transact money. I mean, every other payment or communication system they eventually try. Um, so he built support into the HTTP spec. That is a um, uh, what's called a... Um, uh, a code, an HTTP code 402 uh, for payment uh, required. It's just that it, it's like, it's been reserved for future use uh, for 31 years. <laughs> uh, and that future has not quite come because there is no internet protocol for money. Although there's an internet protocol for like voice over IP, there's an internet protocol for uh, HTTP, there's, um, you know, internet protocols for so many other things, right? Um, but uh, so that that fundamental problem was not solved by, H by HTTP and HTML. That's really web 1.0. It wasn't really solved by web 2.0. And that's why web 3.0 is now trying to solve it. Um, and, uh, and, and the reason it wasn't solved is because Tim Berners-Lee didn't know how to solve it. <laughs> it was like, how do you build an internet protocol for money? That's not a trivial thing to do, um, especially on a distributed system. It's fairly straightforward in a centralized system. You just have an issuer who issues the money. That's what central banks do. Uh, he wasn't, he, he couldn't fathom a distributed way of doing it. So he, he just punted that problem. Um, and and the one of the other things, which is really kind of core to all of this is that the, uh, it's, it's just like societally, like wealth and money is massively important. Uh, and, and so is health, by the way, health is also hugely important. Uh, the, the, if you think financial regulation is complex, just look at healthcare regulation, right? Um, and so uh, the, the uh, kind of, but that's a so choice that we as a society have made, at least in, uh, you know, democracies, right? Like the, all the laws, whether it's 
go back to like the Bank Secrecy Act or like the Dodd Frank. Everything else was passed by legislators who were elected by people, <laughs> and they were responding to concerns by the people who said, "Hey, we want protection from uh, fraud. We want protection from." intermediaries such as banks uh, you know, failing on us and, and, and destroying our deposits. So the whole system of regulation has been created to respond to a problem that existed. I mean, if you go back to like the 1890s, every time there was a recession, there would be a whole run of the banking system in the US, right? That's why the Fed was created originally and then the FDIC. So, the, uh, so in many ways, Web 3.0 is, is, is recreating that whole thing uh, online <laughs> and being like, hey, we're going to have runs on, uh, not on banks now, but on stable coins, right? Um, but the, the, like, the, the fundamental problem is that society and, and people want more control of their data. They want more better financial services and they want uh, better financial well-being, but they don't want it to come at the cost of like more fraud and more, uh, and, and more scams. Right, so the, 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 this is the fundamental kind of like uh, you know tension in the, in this space. If you if it's truly decentralized, if it's truly deregulated, there are no intermediaries. Then whom the hell do you regulate, <laughs> right? And if you can't regulate anything, then who is going to look out to make sure that you aren't going to be scammed? And the answer is nobody. And in which case, there's a lot of people who are going to get scammed. Um, so I don't know the answer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not pretending to to say, hey, here's the here's the solution, but for Web 3.0 to really massively change the the world, I think it does need to uh, you know uh, figure out an answer to this fundamental tension, which is uh, society wants protections to be built into financial services, just like the FDA exists for healthcare, <laughs> um, and and so how do we how do we do that in a Web 3.0 world in a way that everybody can live with? If I... Excellent. Yeah, I want to hear from you, Joanna, and I, but I also want to say that we're going to take some audience questions. Oh, okay. We already have one or two after. I, I absolutely want you to answer this question because I know you've got a lot to say about it. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that if you talk to law enforcement uh, uh, or anti-terrorist uh, entities, uh, they will tell you that there are a lot of virtues in the cryptocurrency systems that we have today. Donna, you're nodding your head. You have deep, deep background in this. Um, we at Air put on a, a tech sprint on the use of cryptocurrency to purchase child sexual abuse material online. And the uh, breakthroughs that came through that in just understanding how you can look at patterns because blockchains are transparent. The, you know, Bitcoin uh, ledgers are right there for everyone to see. And if you have the right tools, you can analyze patterns, find potential patterns of likely crime. And then people may have bought the illicit material with Bitcoin because they think they're anonymous. But if they are using, if they're getting their money in and out of crypto, at an exchange, they that has all the know your customer information right there. If you go to Coinbase, they know your name and address and all your identifying information. So there's tremendous benefits uh, for combating crime in the design of a lot of these cryptocurrencies. On the other hand, there is a risk that as we get further into this space where everything is encrypted, uh, and very hard to break the encryption on. And where potentially instead of having a bank account, you have a wallet that has your tokenized digital identities, which is a huge topic in this to identity uh, confirmation and, and your means of payments as well, then you can envision a system that basically is bypassing the, regula the regulated financial system and is working off to the side uh, to a tremendous extent. And I think we, as Shamir and Donna both said, we cannot go to a place where we say we care about our freedom and our autonomy. And therefore, if 
if the person is a criminal, they can just do whatever they want. We have to have ways of having accountability and traceability in these systems. And I, I do think it's going to be a, a tremendous challenge to get all of that right. Yeah, it's like any interesting question, there, there are tensions. They, they're really all over the place here. Yeah. We've had some audience questions and um, Brad and I have been thinking about how to kind of consolidate them, but there is a lot of overlap. And I actually want to thank the audience because a lot of people are still on. We have not, we have had very little drop off, which is great. Um, the, the sort of the question is, you know, who owns Web 3.0 and will it replace money? That question is popping up in the chat. So does anyone want to take a crack at that? Well, I'll just briefly say kind of the point is nobody owns it um, or even has governance, you know, is likely to have governance over it in the way that we think of that, which is part of the challenge, part of maybe the good and the bad. Um, and the people who are in it so far are mostly crypto firms firms and, um, you know, cutting edge vanguard type firms. As you said, Adam, it is Web3, the front edge of Web3 is finance. We, I don't think we've used the term DeFi yet today, but yeah. decentralized finance is sort of the financial version of this. It's the first use case emerging. So there are firms that are being invested in that are developing these technologies and putting them into use cases, but um, it's too early to tell uh, whether it's gonna re replace money uh, or not. Maybe I'll, answer, I'll ask the question in a slightly different way. Uh, and Shamir, you're an entrepreneur, but okay, in Web 3.0, how do people make money? Oh, the same way they always have, right? By charging uh, for a service that they are providing. Uh, there's multiple different ways uh, to do that. Uh, you could, you know, you could run a, a node and uh, and just mine in Bitcoin or in Ethereum. Ethereum's now in proof of stake, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but what you're really doing there is providing security to the network through this, you know, through the system of mining and you get paid a fee for doing that. Um, the other way to make money is really through speculation. Uh, slash investment. It depends on which side of the coin you're on where, and where you draw the line, with, whether you call it speculation or investment. Uh, and I think the, the, the fundamental ways in which people make money have probably not changed from like, you know, ancient Mesopotamia till now, right? Uh, the fact is that our technology has improved from like scratches on cuneiform and, and in cuneiform on tablets to like being able to do it through through Web3. Uh, the scams haven't changed either, by the way. Uh, there, there was a lot, the, 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 I think the oldest complaint is in the world is like a on a cuneiform tablet from like 1700 BC uh, complaining about somebody who got scammed for copper ingots. I'm like, same sort of stuff, but just done much more efficiently online now when you can tokenize uh, stuff and then people find that those quote unquote copper ingots or whatever don't really exist. Could I jump in really quickly on this? Something that has stayed in my mind was there was an Economist article on DeFi, decentralized finance. I think it was early this year. And an example they gave that I have found useful is they talked about if, a, say, a, there was a woman who was a fashion model. And today, if her picture is taken, the photographer owns the picture. In a Web3 world, there would be the potential that she could have an NFT that would give her an ownership stake in that photograph. And then if she became a supermodel and her, the pictures were super expensive, she would continue to have some ownership in that. That's one of the ways people might make money with this is by owning a continued stake in their content, which today we give away for free on the web for the most part um, through the through the big platforms. But people will be able to go straight to the customer uh, who wants to buy what you have and, and you'll have the potential to own more of it uh, or to price it with more flexibility than you can today. And maybe build yes. off that way. And, and cut out a bunch of intermediaries 
who extract oh, pretty large reds right thing. now. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, Adam, go ahead. I was going to say that one of the interesting things that Joanne's mentioning is that there are some ways that middle class people can earn money here, not just the big tech gazillionaires. You know, and that's reassuring. In terms of the money question, we got the money question from the audience, and I thought maybe a, one of the threads that was also in that was people were asking about taxes and things like that. Donna, that goes to you in terms of following the money, and you've already highlighted a bit of this, but, you know, the government, how are they going to track all this money on Web3? So, first of all, I don't work for the IRS, so I don't speak for them. <laughs> Uh, but I think that Joanne sort of hit on the point, which is that um, there, you know, from what I understand, and I, I uh, like Joanne and unlike Shamir, I can't write, I don't know how to write code, uh, but I, I do know some people who write code. And it seems that you, there's the potential to build into the code for some of these Web3 type technologies, the ability to track money if, you know, for a tax system, for example but that would have to be done and there's also the ability to um to do it in ways that would make it much more difficult to you know um, identify taxable income and and tax it so i think this is one of those one of those areas that you know uh, i guess the, the name of the webinar is you know future 2030 banking um it you know i, I no idea. I mean, maybe we have the Jetsons in 2030 where, you know, uh, every the code is written so that every time, you know, um, I perform a service for someone and they pay me, it automatically uh, is identified in the code and the IRS has access to that and gets it. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have to file a tax return at the end of the year because they take their share. I don't know. That's that's just uh, one possibility. But I think that the, you know, from, from what I understand, uh, from my understanding of it, the, the possibilities are everything from that to, a, you know, a system sort of, a, you know, where there is no ability, you know, there, there's almost no or very, very limited ability to track track that, to differentiate in that way mm -hmm. between, say, income and any other uh, type of uh, value that's flowing over the, th flowing through the, the Web3. Yes. Yes, uh, we're almost out of time. I thought, you know, the title is what will banking look in look like in 2030. And so to that, I kind of was thinking we could have a, a last bullet round question that's a little more future facing, uh, which is just five years from now, you know, what are you going to wish uh, that you had known, perhaps? What are the uncertainties that you hope get answered? Um, or what's the next major milestone in this process? So I'll just continue and say, you know, five years from now, I'm going to wish, I think, so as a regulator, I would wish that the code is being written in a way that protects consumers and, um, you know, I helps uh, helps prevent and help, and when it occurs, identify financial crime. Um, the OCC's just released this new strategic plan uh, for the next five years, and I think that it does, that strategic plan does a great job of recognizing that digitization, digitalization forces, um, you know, require us as a regulator to be incredibly agile and flexible and to build our capabilities as well as our credibility for addressing them. Great to mention consumer protections. Uh, Shamir or Joanne, who wants to jump in first? I think um, FinTech, crypto, Web 3.0, whatever you want to call it, um, the, the is going to be much larger in five years, ten years, fifteen years than it is uh, it is now. Um, just because in some ways it's almost a generational change uh, um, in in just shifting from you know things like walking into a bank branch to using stuff on mobile phones, which seems normal to all of us now, but. Uh, the, um, that that change has, has still got a lot of legs to run in, uh, and, and, the, and so many other, so much more still has to happen. Um, the, the the fundamental tension between sort of much more free, open access to services versus you know uh, protecting consumers and businesses and 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 you know keeping fraud and scams and everything else to to a low to a low level, right? Um, is is going to be a uh, is, is that contention is going to continue? I'm not. I'm not sure we'll solve it in five years. I think I, I sincerely hope we solve at least it, solve it at least partly in the next ten to fifteen. Um, I also think 
Uh, we just went through a crypto bust. Doesn't look so far like it had any systemic impacts. Um, I do think in the next 10 to 15 years, the regulators will have to look at FinTech crypto web 3.0 from a systemic lens because, you know, hedge funds in the 90s weren't a big thing until long-term capital management, <laughs> um, you know, Bear Stearns, Lehman. And the, when the industries are small, they don't really have systemic aspects, but when they grow and the, and this is all going to grow, they will eventually have systemic impacts. I am um, preparing for the uh, program today. I pulled a quote over the weekend from Chris Skinner, who is a British uh, blogger, writes the financier post. And uh, in the middle of an article, he wrote, geez, what is going on here is that coders, kids, and developers are redesigning the financial system right before our eyes. But because most bankers, regulators, and politicians are not coders, kids, and developers, we have no idea. <laughs> and I mean, that sort of crystallizes it. My hope is that through efforts like what you're doing here, five years down the road, we're, we will find that this whole ecosystem has brought these issues to the center of our agenda and that regulators and policymakers have gotten very, uh, very, very well educated, understanding the upside potential and the downside risk both, and are being bringing really smart thinking to these very novel challenges without what the crypto world calls too much FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's a pretty perfect wrap up. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And so um, we are at the hour and I have really enjoyed this. I hope the audience has gotten a lot out of it. I think we managed to start kind of broad and then really do some some deep thinking. So um, I wanna say thanks to the panelists and also to Brad and Chloe who put this together um, and Kaylee. So uh, yes, and if anyone has any more questions, feel free to reach out to NCRC. Uh, we can we can put you perhaps in contact with more people who can provide more answers. But you know, really, really thank you and uh, have a good afternoon.